Mineral evolution is an idea that arose because we realized there are dynamic forces in the Earth, forces which cause the surface of our planet to change over time. So for example, you have melting and freezing and melting again cycles of heat and cold which cause elements to start separating from each other. So you might have more uranium in one place and you'll have a little bit more silicon in another place. That's one. A second one is this idea that we have life as a dynamic force that creates disequilibrium between different parts of, of our environment. Life, for example, produces oxygen, a toxic gas that never would occur on a planet in the concentration we have without having some, some driving force. Life keeps that disequilibrium, it pulls the elements apart again, and you create new niches. What happens in evolution? New minerals form in new evolutionary niches. Oh, you know, it's fascinating to think about mineral evolution in this context of other kinds of evolution, biological evolution, and the evolution of languages, and the evolution of material cultures like cars and computers. And there are many common themes. There's a species, a mineral species. Each different kind of mineral is a distinct species. You have things like punctuation. You have selection. You have all different kind, niches, specific niches. But it differs from biology in a very important way because it's how the species change over time. In mineralogy, each of these minerals is the same throughout time. There's a blue mineral, azurite, a green mineral, malachite, many other minerals. They have the same composition, they have the same formula, they have the same structure. That doesn't change over billions of years. In life, the species have the ability to mutate because of this unique genetic code that we have. It's fascinating to think about this interplay between minerals on the one hand and life. And it works both ways. Turns out the origin of life may have been absolutely dependent on certain minerals. Mineral surfaces are a perfect place to concentrate, to select, to organize, to make larger structures like polymers, chains of molecules that have biological function. So minerals may have played a key role in life's origin. But by the same token, and this is what I find so amazing, that life played a key role in the minerals origin. There are certain minerals, uh, these, these beautiful blue and green minerals, azurite and malachite, they're copper minerals, but they could only form in an oxygen-rich environment, an environment that was created by living things. If you have a world, perhaps Mars, certainly Mercury, where you have no oxygen, these minerals will not form. There's no way to produce them. And so we see that life has a role in the origin of minerals, just the way minerals have a role in the origin of life. This idea, why didn't somebody think of it 30 or 40 years ago? It was, it was there, it was ready to be thought about, but mineralogists were stuck in this, just I was, I was, crystal structures, chemical formulas, hardness, color, properties, you know, what is, you measure the mineral that exists in your hand, rather than thinking about its history. Was there any azurite or malachite in the Paleozoic? You know, was, you can ask these questions, and then you start thinking about, well, when did what minerals come into play? And how has the surface mineralogy changed over time? And what factors lead to that? And how did life come into this? And what is the role of, of life then in mineral diversification? If you look at other planets, Venus, Mercury, Mars, are they going to be different? And if they are different, what does that tell you about the surface of the planet? And how does plate tectonics come into the... You know, you ask the questions just start flooding out. And you realize this is a whole new way of framing mineralogy. It's a story. People love stories. And the old way of teaching mineralogy, the classic way, memorizing the names and the formula and the hardness and the space group and all these, that's, that's still important. But now we look at this and we say, there's a story here. And that story is part of not just the earth, but it's a story of life as well. We are beginning to ask a whole series of new questions. One of them is to look at individual elements of the periodic table. There are about 100 of them. And say, OK, what's the story with uranium, thorium, 
plutonium. That's one paper that's almost written now for those elements. Plutonium is an element which is radioactive. And the half-life of the longest-lived isotope variant of plutonium is about 80 million years. So early in Earth's history, it's very possible that the little bit of plutonium that was there was selected and concentrated through melting and, and freezing through fluids circulating through rocks, concentrating, concentrating, and you could have had plutonium minerals. And you could have had those minerals, small grains of plutonium oxide or some other mineral, for the first 100 or 200 million years of Earth's history. That's possible. But in this particular case, it's an idiosyncrasy, plutonium, is extinct. It's gone. There's no more plutonium because it's radioactive and it's all decayed away. And unless we manufacture plutonium in our reactors, which is what we do in breeder reactors, there's really no plutonium anywhere on the surface of the Earth. I think the really exciting sound bite to all this is our recognition, once again, of the dynamic Earth and how interconnected these different sciences are. You cannot be a geologist without thinking about biology. You can't be a biologist without thinking about geology. So here we have the whole concept of evolution. What could be more basic to science than evolution? But you have to put it together somehow with this science of mineralogy, which was taught in a completely different way. And now we have this new way of thinking about a very old subject. Mm -hmm.